Thanks, Susan. Um, I have to start with an object lesson. Uh, when I saw this conference was going to be held in Red Deer, uh, I sent an email to Stu Root. And I said, Stu, you should go to Red Deer and present your research on functional flows. And he says, I think it would be a good idea if you did that. <laughs> I, I think that's true. But then he said, he's not getting away scot-free. He's presenting later today, too. But it, it is my pleasure. I've been involved with Stu over a number of years on this kind of work. And uh, what I hope to do today is, is use uh, some of Stu's research findings to uh, put some of the real challenges we have uh, in southern Alberta, perhaps into a little bit of a new light, and suggest a direction we can go that will be uh, very valuable to all of us and help meet some of the objectives that uh, uh, perhaps have been puzzling us to some degree. So I, I want to start, though, first by looking back a bit. Um, we have Alberta's Water for Life strategy. I think most of us are quite familiar with what this is and the goals and objectives, and then the key actions that were identified to help us get there. Um, we're a little longer than a decade into the Water for Life strategy. I think it's accomplished an awful lot, at least attitudinally, in Albertans. And then taking a look at the interest level that there is in water issues across the province, watershed stewardship groups, the WPACs, the work that's been going on in research in universities, I think Alberta really has taken up water and remains highly committed to it and the evidence of that is in conferences like these and another one that's going on the same two days in Edmonton on environmental modeling all at the same time all with about the same number of participants. I also want to look back at a couple of other things and I'm not going to read this and you don't have to read it but the Alberta Water Act when it was updated brought in a whole bunch of new tools that we could use to help achieve a number of objectives. And part of these was this whole idea around water conservation objectives and what they are and how they could be established and what they were intended to do to help deal with the issues around uh, healthy aquatic ecosystems. And so there was a structure brought into place to start to address some of these particular issues. Also looking back, uh, we have the South Saskatchewan uh, River Basin uh, plan that has been through two phases. Uh, very good engagement from stakeholders in the basin, uh, a lot of high participation in those. And what happened as a result of the approval of that plan was a setting of some of these water conservation objectives. And I've just listed here that the objective is 45% of the natural rate of flow or the existing in-stream objectives plus 10%. This is in the uh, Bow, Old Man and South Sass basins. And I think all of us are familiar with this and what the current situation is. We have this as well for the Red Deer subbasin and some of the same kinds of conditions, 45% of the natural rate, a different uh, minimum flow. But again, something that was established that took a look at how we can use the mechanisms in the Water Act to partially at least identify the water conservation objectives. It didn't necessarily mean we were going to achieve them but it set them as objectives. Well, as we all know, due to a lot of the existing allocations, many WCOs are not met. Conservation holdbacks, another one of the mechanisms in the Water Act, are fairly mandatory in their application. But even with these, they're not likely to be sufficient to achieve the water conservation objectives that have been established in any short or recognizable piece of time. Now, I'm not speaking against WCOs, but what I'm trying to do is put in a little bit of a practical light what we've managed to do. There was great engagement in the setting of these water conservation objectives. Wide range of discussions by watershed planning and advisor groups and others. A lot of debate about what some of the values were associated with water in these basins. And so a fairly informed decision that came to 45% of natural flow, taking into account all of the issues that were there. But the 45% is a percentage, and to some degree, even at the end of the day, it's somewhat arbitrary. So looking forward, um, some of the work that's been taking place uh, in the province, uh, and much of it at the University of Lethbridge, has really been looking at some of these issues and trying to identify, is there an alternate way 
that you could actually bring in a very evidence-based approach to take a look at this issue of healthy aquatic ecosystems in a way that actually recognizes the demands that we already have on the system and might be more progressive, adaptable, and flexible on a go-forward basis. And so for about the last four years, Stu has been part of a team that has been looking at this, and I really feel fortunate that I can present some of his results on functional environmental flows. Uh, this did involve the folks at the U of C and the U of A, uh, funded largely by uh, the Alberta Water Research Institute in its early days, and then Alberta Innovates uh, in the latter part of the time. So I think we've all seen pictures like this. Um, if we're going to talk about water and environment and uh, riparian systems and healthy aquatic ecosystems, we can look at these kinds of, of images. Uh, river ecosystems do require in-stream flow. You have the trees, the trout. You can get a situation where there's really not much there. Um, I saw a report recently out of uh, Montana where a couple uh, streams uh, in a hundred years every year dry up and have now been reestablished through some other mechanisms. So I think this is the stark contrast and what we want to do is as we've had these debates about what to do about this, a lot of the discussion has been around well how could we get back to something that's a more natural flow regime? How could we bring in perhaps some of the more of the principles of in-stream flow management. And so there's been a lot written about this, a lot published about this. There's other language that's been used around it. I've read pieces around biomimicry, trying to get a system that operates at a lower level that has the same kind of pattern that the natural flow would do, etc. cetera. Um, if you saw Mike Nemeth's presentation in the session before this, you take a look at rivers like the Bow, well they haven't really had natural flow in a century. They've been highly managed systems. And so looking at the prospects of trying something like this, well when you start to take a look at what the given diversion allocations are, it's really impractical to get back to restoring natural regimes. We don't live in a natural world. None of us, many of us have probably never ever even experienced that uh, in the areas of the province that we live. So what could we do to find new ways to do a better job that would make, take into account the existing allocations but actually bring some good robust science to the table? And so this is this whole piece around functional flow. So I'm, I'm going to show you a few charts and, and hydrographs. Um, every hydrograph has certain pieces of this. Uh, there is the part of the hydrograph that really focuses on channel formation and the streamside community, that's part of the riparian ecosystem. And then you have the aquatic in-stream community and water quality. I'm not going to talk much about the water quality, but to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's an annual hydrograph. And this is the piece that really is the high flows for channel development. This is the piece that we need that is going to do the scouring and everything else. And this is something that really does occur, by and large, completely naturally. We have the riparian zone. This is the post-flood ramping. Uh, very good for cottonwood recruitment. This is the time where you can actually build some of this riparian ecosystem and sustain it. And then we have the aquatic ecosystem. These are where you have enough flows for temperature and dissolved oxygen. And of course in Alberta, because we have low flows in winter, we are concerned often about oxygen under ice. So this is kind of the typical hydrograph. So if we start to take a look at what does this mean in Alberta, and we start to take a look at the periods and timing, we can look at, as this shows, wet years, dry years, and a couple of, of normal years, and start to take a look at what this might mean. For functional flows to work, the high flow, uh, excuse me, the high flow functions really occur in the high flow years. Those are years we don't really have any problem with. And so if we use this as the basis for what we're going to do and capitalize on this, it may give us opportunities to increase resilience. So the high flows again are for the channel development. The riparian again is in this uh, ramping down from those high flood flows. And as we move forward and start to look at how these could be adapted, here we have a normal hydrograph 
showing the various pieces. And if we take a look at what water conservation objectives might give us against this natural flow, what we'll see is that we get this flow, which is a 45% of natural. And then you can take a look at where your repair and survival and other pieces are and have a look at how successful we might be if we achieve this. And in some places, we're not achieving this. The functional flow argument is really flow when you need it the most for these particular functions. And so here, you can see this green line, which shows what a functional flow approach would be that is different from the current WCOs. So what it would really mean is looking for management opportunities that really would allow you to deal with these pieces here. So we might take a look at this and say, well, it looks like there are opportunities to do something different. So the whole approach, this is a, a, an image of stews from uh, the Old Man River in 2011. The functional flows really is we want to have environmental benefit from the high flow years that compensate for things in the low flow years. What can we do to capitalize on uh, those high flow years that will make us better performers in the other years? And compensate for that stress. So while you may look at this as theoretical, this actually is in practice and has been tested and piloted and I'll show you some of those results. So 2011, we began the season with a fair amount of moisture, fairly well saturated fields, good snowpack, heavy rains, abundant water, and something new in southern Alberta that we've seen a couple times, uh, flooding. So just to take a look at what this may mean for uh, some of the approach, uh, here you have the blue is the natural hydrograph. This is the uh, lower Waterton River in 1985. Uh, red is what would have been done. And of course, the operators of the facilities, because of all of the demands on the system, are really looking to store as much water as they can early in the year, save it so it can be released during the year, so that they can meet all of those other demands. And what often happens is you may manage and store water, and then you can get to the end of the year when all of a sudden your reservoirs are fuller than you need them to be. And so you do some release and draw back down so that you've got room to store water the next season. So looking at perhaps what the functional flow regime would be, this green line, what we're really looking to do is identify, are there management opportunities? where you can take this amount of flow and move it into this zone so that you can better manage for those uh, functional flows. So here's some, some actuals. Uh, this is the St. Mary's River and the Waterton River. Uh, these are the actuals. And this is work that has been piloted uh, in these systems uh, with all of the users engaged to really try and template and model uh, in real life what this approach means. And so you can see that uh, the naturalized flow is here. This is the actual flows. But these red lines are the important ones. These are the lines that would allow for the recruitment of cottonwoods and the improvement of the riparian ecosystem. And you can see that after the high flow periods, the releases in the St. Mary's and Waterton actually did generally follow this trend. In both cases, we probably still were storing more water than needed and had to have uh, a bump and some release later on to meet our end of the year conditions. But it did result in lots of cottonwood recruitment. And this is essential in this overall zone of management for the riparian ecosystem. There's other ways to look at this and some other requirements, uh, things important to the cottonwoods. Uh, the ramping is very, very important. The percent of days where you have less than four centimeters per day drawdown on that zone, showing what the response has been in the Waterton and Old Man, uh, naturalized versus actual. But I think we can see that if we take a look at what these opportunities are, there are real things that we can do to improve environmental performance. So there is some cost to this approach. And uh, there's been a high level of cooperation between government departments, irrigation districts, and others. 
uh, on the old man and in the Waterton uh, to try these approaches. Uh, there is always, when you're keeping water in storage and releasing it on a staged amount to meet these objectives, there is a slight risk relative to supply. Um, there is also a, probably a little bit of extra work in making sure that you've got all of the information you need to make the decisions. And then the commitment to actually going out and assessing the success of what you've achieved in the field. Benefits, of course, in this case, uh, as we've seen, are the cottonwood recruitment, the invigoration of the aquatic and riparian ecosystems, improvements in water quality, bank stability, fish and wildlife, and recreation. <coughs> so significant improvements with really no implication to existing users by taking a little bit different approach. So this is something I think that we can give a lot more attention to is the, an overall management approach to the systems using some of this scientific evidence as a way of identifying what we can do on a go-forward basis. And the nice thing is it capitalizes on the high flow years and the average years. And things will look different in the low flow years because you'll have less opportunity to store. But we'll hopefully create the kind of resiliency and robustness that will continue to get uh, improved environmental outcomes. So we're really talking in functional flows about artificial patterns to optimize water use. It supports physical processes, plants and animals in that zone. And then the environmental benefits in those wet years really compensate for the stress during the dry years. So moving forward, uh, Stu was engaged as well in the work on the Bow River project and is involved as well uh, on the current work in the uh, South Saskatchewan Adaptation Project. And these new approaches are being brought into some of the modeling and some of the discussion uh, with the stakeholders in the basins. And so there's an opportunity as we go forward to find more opportunities to implement these functional flows. From where I'm sitting, looking at the potential conflicts between water users and the potential opportunities to have real evidence-based practices, this looks like it could evolve in Alberta to be a new performance measure. This may be a new emerging definition of what water conservation objectives could be that could be attached to some real evidence. In addition to this, uh, we're hoping to undertake some work soon that will give us a better handle on some of the riparian vegetation and might also result in a way to model other things than just the uh, stage drawdown from high flow years and a better understanding of what we can do to actually support uh, that vegetative zone within the riparian ecosystems. And with that, I guess my final comment is I think we are in an area where we have the ability to try some of these new ideas without adverse implications to all of the users in a way that's a lot more creative and a lot more sustainable and perhaps scientifically robust than the current situation that we have and to be able to achieve environmental benefits much sooner. Thank you very much.